there's a lot of evidence, which Farrell has probably told you, galaxies continue, they fade out, they don't have a nice sharp edge, they keep on and on and on. Now, the statement is very, very simple. There is a, a background, there is a detection limit. And you can detect the galaxy if it's above the limit, and you don't detect the part of it which is below the limit. Why is there a detection limit? Because there's all sorts of noise. There's noise in your detector system. There's noise in the night sky. And so for any particular... In fact, quite often the night sky level will be quite a lot more than your detector. Through sophisticated techniques, you can see things at a fraction of the night sky level. You just use sophisticated statistics and detectors and so on. But in any case, the basic point is that there is a selection limit. You see... You see the thing. Your detector says, yes, if this rises above and if this is a bit below, you don't see it because it is lost in the background fluctuations in your photographic plate or the shot noise from your CCD detector or whatever. And so, in fact, there can be masses and masses of low luminosity galaxies which we don't detect. If you... And furthermore, what you can see here, the apparent size of this galaxy, if you succeed now in getting much better detectors, much better statistics, you get a much lower detection limit, that galaxy will look larger. It will appear on your photographic plate. You saw it out there, and then it faded into the background. A better plate, you will see it further out. Its apparent size will be a function of this limit. If you get worse and worse um, detectors. If your <laughs> detection limit gets worse, you will lose it. And that's basically what happens to stars during the day. They're still there. It's just that the background has come up so much that we don't see the stars during the day. So there really is a really interesting kind of thing going on here. When you deal with very, very deep galaxy surveys or very shallow galaxy surveys, how many things are there out there which you are not seeing? And the key point about all of this is it depends very much on the radius. If you take a galaxy of a particular size, you may or may not detect it. Make it twice as large. Same number of photons, it's twice as large, so the intensity has gone down as the square of the apparent size of the galaxy. And so the size of galaxies, the apparent sizes, is just as important in their detection as the intrinsic brightness at the center of the galaxy. And this is something which needs to be taken into account when you look at all galaxy statistics. And um, whenever you look at magnitude redshift curves, there's hidden statistics underlying that. When you have um, angular size redshift curves, the key point is all the galaxies you're not seeing. And that all depends on the detection theory here. There's a bit more about these in these notes. So... That's really quite an interesting kind of thing. However, I mustn't spend too much time on this um, because I want to say something about horizons. I've got two more things I want to talk about now. This evening, I'll be talking about the concordance model and how good it is, evidence queries about it. And then tomorrow in my final lecture, I'm going to do something quite different. I'm not going to be talking about cosmological models. I'm going to be talking about local physics and the universe, which is quite an interesting topic in its own way. Okay, what I need to do now is move on to section 8, page 133, which is causal properties. So, here's our past light cone going down, and there's the surface of last scattering. And the point about it, which I've made many, which I we'll keep on emphasizing. If you think of the past light cone, here we are. We receive, here, here is our world line. Here's the surface of last scattering. We can't see earlier because the universe is opaque. There is a maximum radius to which we can see. Now, how do we work that out? We work that out by going to our basic formula over here, this formula here, and the radius function at the visual horizon, is the integral from the time of decoupling to the present day d t over a t. So this is the time of decoupling. Here's today. The radius up there is given by that little formula there, and you can just sit down and work it out. 
And this is what is normally called the Hubble radius, or it's normally what's called the size of the universe. I, of course, have told you the universe is potentially much, much bigger than that, but this is what is often called the size of the universe. It's the, it's the furthest distance we can see. Now, a galaxy that formed here will intersect our world line, and we will see it at that time in its history. A galaxy which formed closer in, we will see at a later time in its history. A galaxy which formed further out, we will see an earlier time. And a galaxy there, we will never see. We get no information from it because it never intersects our past light cone, this side of decoupling. So there is a horizon, and the horizon is the set of galaxies which are the limit between the ones we can see and the ones we can't see. And there is a most beautiful article on horizons by Wolfgang Rindler in Monthly Notices of the Royal Astronomical Society in 1957, I think it is, which is still an absolute classic article because there was a huge amount of confusion about horizons until Rindler's paper, which very clearly sorted out the fact that we are surrounded by this sphere. We've seen the galaxies inside in principle. We c the ones here, that's the matter which is the limit that we can reach to by any radiation, and we cannot receive any information from the galaxies outside. And that is the visual horizon. Now, there's a separate thing, which is the particle horizon, which is the integral from zero to today, dt over at, and that is the limit of causal communication. Actually, I have to say, Rindler's paper was about this, not that one. To get that one, you have to go back down to the time t is naught and see how far your light cone has reached at the time t is naught. Now, I've already said that the light cone is refocusing, and in fact, at the time of the hot Big Bang, in fact, the light cone comes back to a point, which is actually fairly easy to prove if you think about it. At the Big Bang, the light cone coalesces to a point. So it's rather difficult dealing with all of this until we use a device that Roger Penrose introduced of conformal diagrams. So in order to see what is happening, go conformal. Now, what that means is, here, you ask yourself, can I make this metric conformal to flat space-time? And what you do is you say, I'm just going to look at the radial part of the metric, minus dt squared plus a squared of t uh, dr squared. What you say to yourself is, I'd like to write that in the following form as a squared of t into minus d tor squared plus dr squared. Can I bring that to that form? Well, yes, easy. You just need minus dt squared as a squared of t d tor squared, or two minuses cancel out, so you just need that d tor is um, dt over a. You just need to change to that conformal time, and this will be your metric form instead of this. Why is that good? Because then the null cone is given to you by d tor squared is dr squared. That is, d tor is plus or minus dr. What you've done, you've changed coordinates from coordinates t and r to coordinates tor and r, until your light cone is at 45 degrees, just like in flat space. What that means is you've gone to coordinates which show you the causal relations perfectly. Now, distances are totally misleading, <laughs> and so you must never believe spatial distances when you're using conformal diagrams. But the causal relationships are shown what can affect what causally becomes 100% clear. So what happens to the Robertson-Walker models when we use conformal coordinates? What happens is we now choose conformal time tor and this coordinate radius r. Okay, this will be today, and our light cone is at 45 degrees because we've gone to some trouble to make sure that our light cone is at 45 degrees. This will be the time of the Big Bang. This will be the time of decoupling. And this will be the present day. Now, galaxy world lines are still vertical world lines. That is a line R is constant. And our transformation did not affect that. We changed the time. We didn't change the spatial coordinates. So galaxy world lines are still lines R is constant. 
And here you get a very, very clear picture of the causal relations. From here, down to the surface of light scattering, we receive light down to here, and this is the path of the particle horizon, a particle which is the limit between what we can see and what we cannot see visually. And on the other side, it is over here, and if you put that all together, we are surrounded by a sphere. The sphere is the limit to which we can have seen. Now, what does that correspond to physically? It's nothing other than the surface of last scattering. When you look at those COBE pictures or the map, the, the, all of those satellite pictures of the microwave background, you're seeing the sky. You're seeing the visual horizon. That's exactly what you're seeing. The matter at the visual horizon is the matter which emitted the microwave background radiation because that's the furthest we can see. And that's, sorry, that's the visual horizon. The particle horizon is a little bit further out. From further out from the particle horizon, now this is the Big Bang, so you can't continue anymore. There's no space, there's no time, there's no nothing below there. So this is the farthest that any causal connection can come from. So if we can see someday neutrino telescopes, we'll see out to here. Gravitational wave telescopes, we'll see out to here. But we will never, ever see past that horizon, as long as special relativity locally remains a valid theory. So the particle horizon is a sphere surrounding the visual horizon. We can have had causal contact with everything up to the particle horizon. We can have had visual contact up to everything up to the visual horizon. We cannot have visual contact any further. We cannot have causal contact any further. Unless we live in a small universe. Remember what I said yesterday. <laughs> so if you live in a small universe, the topology is wrapped around and there aren't any horizons, if you remember what I said yesterday. So I keep on emphasizing a small universe is absolutely 100% different from a universe which continues forever. Okay. If there's a small universe, we've seen everything there is in the universe, and that's fantastic, but that's probably not the case. <laughs> the probable case is there is this visual horizon and the particle horizon. This now leads to the famous horizon problem. Looking in this direction, we measure microwave background radiation from the point P, and looking in this direction, we measure microwave background radiation from the point Q. So looking in that direction, Q, in that direction, P. 2.75K from there, 2.75K from there, which means that conditions here must be very, very much the same as conditions there. Great. What's the problem? The problem is that the past of the point P is that region there, and the past of the point Q is that region here, and that's the beginning of the universe. No causal influence from here can affect anything that happens over there. So why is the universe such that the microwave background there is the same as there when there can't have been any causal communication between them? And that's the horizon problem. Now, there are two attitudes to this. One attitude is to say, so what's the problem? The universe was made that way. And that's all there is to it. <laughs> and that is the view which some people take, and it certainly was the view which was taken up and until 1980, it's very interesting to go to Weinberg's book that was mentioned earlier today and to read his section on the uh, Copernican principle in cosmology. And Weinberg says, and I quote, Weinberg says, it is inconceivable that we are at the center of the universe, which would be one of the ways in which things could be different. Weinberg takes, and Bondi takes, and all the old books, they justify the cosmological principle on philosophical grounds. And that is the correct way to do it. It can only be justified on philosophical grounds. And you still can go back to old arguments. And if you want to say the reason it's the same everywhere is because it was built the same way everywhere. That's the way the creation mechanism worked. That's all there is to say. However, with inflation, you can say, actually, things change. If you go to an inflationary universe, you see, the standard horizon comes from putting in there A is T to the half. You remember I worked out yesterday the asymptotic form of this in the hot Big Bang area is t to the half, and that's what gives the scales here. If we had an exponential expansion in here, suddenly this integral becomes much larger. And the effect on this diagram, if there is inflation, is to shift this surface down a huge amount. 
And the effect of inflation is to shift down in this conformal diet.